All right, everybody, we're going to get started. UHF is connected. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is Sharon Donnelly. She's an occupational therapist with Advanced Pediatric Therapies. And um, she is not only offering this kind of training information night for families, but she also comes in and observes our classrooms a few times a year so that she can um, assist teachers in making sure that um, we're meeting kids' needs where they're at. Um, she also has an agreement with us that occupational therapy lists to get in for evaluations are really long for children. So we um, are set up with her that if there's any concerns with any kids that are in our program and parents want to get an evaluation, um, we can email and contact her and she will move them up the list um, to get evaluated uh, so that nobody falls uh, between the cracks. So we wanna say thank you to her for doing this tonight and thank you to all of you who came in person and also um, on our live stream tonight. I know, really, thank you, Lindsay. I think it's been, it's so amazing that you have a director who's really willing to reach out to the community to try to get support for the kids in the preschool that might need a little additional support. And the teachers here are fantastic. So I own Advanced Pediatric Therapies. It's been in business 21 years. Uh, 21 in Portland, and I think 15 in Vancouver. And part of the commitment I made when opening the practice was to educate the community and teachers and parents and other even therapist professionals on what sensory processing disorder is. And from the very beginning, Little Acorn has been one of the preschools that has consistently referred kids when needed or asked us to come in. We've, we've had a working relationship with Little Acorn for many years. So I'm very excited and um, grateful for the relationship that we've had both to serve your families and for the business back to the clinic. So thank you to Little Acorn and families. And thank you for coming in. I know live stream too. You had many reasons why you couldn't come in, but coming in live, I really appreciate it when live stream was an option as well. So thank you. I am not wearing this thing. I don't know how it fits. I move too much. So it's going to be like this. Also, I've never done a Facebook Live, so this is really new for me. I teach all the time. I love to teach. I love to educate parents on what sensory processing is and how it contributes to normal development. The plan for tonight is to talk about how does sensory processing affect normal development and then what happens when it is disrupted for a variety of different reasons and what might that look like and how can you support your children in your home when something looks like maybe a flag for some behavioral or emotional regulation, um, academic, cognitive, social difficulties, how can you support them maybe in your home, as well as how can the school maybe work to support them as well. So it's a small group, feel free to ask questions. I love being dynamic that way, so feel free to ask questions. I know on, on um, Facebook as well, they're able to type in questions or do questions as well, so I look forward to this evening with you guys. I'm sorry you don't have a PowerPoint, but you do have handouts, so we'll we'll make it work. If you can see that first slide, 21.9% of children in the United States have a mental, emotional, developmental, or behavioral problem at this point. And I, I've been doing occupational therapy since 98, and it is really true that we're seeing an increased prevalence of anxiety-based disorders, attention disorders, autism, and other social-emotional regulation difficulties. So we are definitely seeing a, an increased prevalence of a lot of those disturbances in, um, in childhood. And teachers are constantly asking now, what do we do? How do we support these children in the classroom? And we are working hard with teachers to help you know, figure out what is a, that behavior that that child is demonstrating, trying to tell you. All behavior has meaning. And behavior typically has one of four meanings. It's either to get your attention, to escape something, usually something sensory-based or something that has put you in a state of fight, flight, or fright, to get something tangible or to meet a sensory need. UHF is connected. Sorry. So I want you guys to start thinking about behavior that way. And also, I, I love that you're here. Many of you, probably a lot of you, um, at this point, or maybe aren't even recognizing that your child has any disruption in the way that they're developing. Maybe today we'll just give you a sense of how to continue to foster that typical development for your child. 
Also, if you do have concerns for your child, there's a, some red flags that you might be looking for to see if that's sort of within the typical range or if that's something you need to support. If you think about the fact that 21.9% of children are suffering from some sort of emotional, mental, or physical difficulty, the idea is that if we can put supports in place early enough for these children, we can help change their path of development, help really change the way that they learn and grow. And so that's, that's what I hope to give for you guys today as parents, it's just some knowledge of different ways to support their needs. And you guys have, some of you have three-year-olds. Three-year-olds are hard. You know, it's really fun to work with a zero to five population, but three-year-olds can be quite tricky because the question always is, is it just because he's three? Is it just because she's three? Is it because they're a boy? All those questions I know come to the surface. And I do want to highlight that the things that I talk about tonight, just because your child exhibits one of the difficulties that I may talk about does not mean that there's anything wrong with your child at all. It just means that there's one area that your child might need a little bit different support in. We all have sensory systems. You will use your sensory system tonight to support you as you listen to me speak. Many of you have been at work all day or you've been with your families all day. You're tired, you might be hungry, you might realize at some point you need to use the restroom. You might do something, you most likely will do something to support yourself in this environment as I speak. It might be you just wiggle your foot a little bit. It might be that you play with your hair. It might be that you put something in your mouth. We all do that. We do that throughout our lives to support our nervous system to meet our arousal level to meet the demands of the situation that you're at. Children need a lot more, oftentimes. Also, some children are avoiding a lot of that stuff, so we'll go through some of that. On the, one of the slides that you have, there's this image of a child and the way that um, development occurs. The first thing that you'll see is that the first level of regulation happens deep in the brain stem. Deep in the brain stem is where the child first begins to develop and a lot of the basic reflexive reactions and the autonomic nervous system control, suck, swallow, breathe, all of those things happen low, low in the brain stem. From there, you get the second letter level of development and then you get cortical development. So if you see that the way that the child's nervous system develops, any child's nervous, any individual's nervous system develops is from the brain stem up. What happens in the brainstem, the input that we get there is into our sensory systems. The sensory systems that you learned about probably in preschool or kindergarten, taste, touch, smell, hear, and see. But there's two other systems that we're gonna talk about tonight that, that need input into the nervous system to support regulation, to support behavior, to support attention, to support all those things that children need. I love, you know what an occupational therapist is? We help people get back to their occupation. What's a child's occupation? Play. I play all day. It's the best job in the world. Play, social skills, fine motor skills, gross motor skills, getting dressed in the morning, eating a full meal, the ability to hold the fork to eat the meal. Those are all a child's occupation. All the sensory input that comes into the nervous system supports that child's ability to develop all those skills and all those occupations. When I look at if there's a disruption in the way that the nervous system is processing sensory information, the question really is, is, is it disrupting function? So just because your child might have tags that it bother them in the back of their shirt and need to you know, change their shirt a number of times, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a sensory processing disorder. It just, if that's standing alone and they can just change your shirt, put on another shirt and move on, it's probably no big deal. Now, if you take 30 minutes to 45 minutes getting out of the house in the morning because nothing feels good on that child's body, we might be starting to talk something a little bit different. So sensory processing or sensory integration is the organization of sensation for use. At any one minute, you are bombarded by billions and billions of pieces of sensory information. There's a fan on in here somewhere. You know, someone next to you might ruffle a paper. Um, you'll get, you know, visual stimulation is coming in. Auditory stimulation is coming in. Interoceptive stimulation is coming in. Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Do I have to go to the bathroom? You are bombarded by billions and billions of pieces of information, and it's the nervous system's job deep in the brainstem to decide, am I going to pay attention to that information? 
Is it important to me? Do I need, is it novel? Is it intense? Is it something I'm not familiar with? Did you hear the car go by? Your nervous system said, Zhip. what is that? Oh, that's a car, not important. I don't need to pay attention to it. I don't want to talk too much about what sensory disruptions might look like because I really want to talk about typical development to support many of you. But what that, a, a nervous system that is um, d having difficulty processing that sensory information might never have answered that what is it question. It might have said, what was that? And it might even walk towards that it over there and then something happens over here. I'm gonna come way over here. And then something happened over here. I'm gonna come way over here. What does that child look like? <laughs> That's what the parent looks like and the teacher looks like. What, what, is, what diagnosis would likely happen for that child? ADHD. So sensory processing disorder or sensory processing contributes to our ability to tune into what's important in the environment and block out what's not. We do it all day, every day. Your children do it all day, every day. They're being asked to do it numerous times at school. You know, the teacher says, okay, come to the circle, come to the circle. All the kids have to then tune in to the teacher's talking to me. Something important has happened to me. Know where my body is in space to know that I need to go this way to go to the circle sit down in the circle without sitting on their friend's lap. Then when they're sitting in the circle, they need to be able to sit and attend and sustain that attention, hopefully without like rocking all over the place, landing in their friend's lap, standing up, you know, playing with their hair, eating everything. Again, some of that's totally normal for a two to five year old. It's when it becomes a lot and the child is having a lot of difficulty performing the occupation that they needed to do. So. Um, sensory integration is the organization of sensation for use. The two senses that I didn't mention, so you know, sight, touch, hear, smell, see, olfactory, we also talk as occupational therapists about vestibular system information. That's your movement system. That's your system that tells you how fast you're moving, what direction you're moving, if you're right side up or if you're upside down. It's the system that gives you your you are here marker. It's the system that says, here I am in this space in relation to you. Helps me to navigate my way through the space to get to you. So that's the vestibular system. It plays so much importance into attention and focus. So oftentimes, and kids need a lot more movement, oftentimes, like if you tell your three to five year old in general that you're gonna to go to the park, they're gonna get so excited, and when they get there, they might wanna swing on the swing, and they wanna go higher and faster, and what is that favorite word that you love to hear? Again, again, again! They want more and more and more. They love Oaks Park, they love roller coasters. If I say to many of you, we're gonna go ride a ride at, the roller, at, at Oaks Park, many of you might go, you know, kids generally need more movement to help them attend and learn and focus. Some kids truly need it. Like can't sit still to pay attention and focus. Actually need to be moving. Teachers at Little Acorn are super great about noticing that your child might have difficulty sitting in circle. And while that is probably an expectation or a hope for your child, also recognize that some children need a little more movement than others. And some children might need to go to the back of the circle at circle time, or might need to stand up and take a movement break, or might need some sort of adaptive seating. And all that's within the range of normal. Though some kids have a little more difficulty than others, and then at that point, we might need to explore if there's some things we might need to do in addition to just compensation strategies to support that child's vestibular system. The other system I didn't talk about is the joint muscle system, the proprioceptive system. That's the joint muscle system that tells me, um, I'm sorry, sir, I saw you lift your cup up a minute ago. You probably didn't think about how you had to grasp your hand, how much uh, uh, pressure you needed to use as you lifted that cup up to your mouth, how you, far you needed to open your mouth, and all those things to, to, to lift that cup. Your cup is very different than yours. Yours might even be almost empty. As it was full, you used a little different pressure than when it was empty. Those are things you don't think about. You don't think about how high you're going to lift your leg to walk up the stairs. You know, by a very young age, two-ish, maybe even younger, kids can walk up stairs alternating feet. If you have a four-year-old or a five-year-old who is still walking up stairs with two feet on each stair or feel like they have to hold on to something, starts to begin to sort of not necessarily be a huge red flag, but something you might, you know, consider. Like, is this child really getting a lot of awareness about where their body is as they move through space? It's the same system that later as your teacher asks you to do coloring and writing activities, 
tells you how to form the pencil, how to hold the pencil without having to think about it. By the time a child is, I mean, teachers help me, by the, you see probably in your two-year-old class that children don't really, um, some of the children are beginning to hold the pencil like you and I do, in it, what we call a tripod grasp. And there's a range. You could find, if you Googled what is the average age of a mature tripod grasp, you're going to get a variety of different things. But typically, most kids, we will see holding a utensil correctly by three and a half. Yeah, yeah. So um, some kids will still be fisted, some will be pronated, some will be four finger, some will be light, some will use too much pressure that they break through the paper, some will use too little. All of that is somewhat within a normal range of expectation. Now, if they start to have a lot of flags in a lot of these different areas, then we kind of say, hmm, you know, is there something else or some other way that we can support this child to give their body the information they need so that they no longer have to think about this, so that holding a pencil just becomes natural to that child. As occupational therapists, we used to get kids referred to us a lot for handwriting. And if a child was coming to me at the age of eight, still not holding a pencil right, it was not for lack of trying. I mean, in our, in our generation, we have been pushing pencil and paper tasks on children from a very young age. So if they still don't have it with practice by eight, then usually it's something else happening in the joint muscle system, um, a, a visual, something else that's happening for that child. So, and there is a normal progression of how a child will hold a pencil or a fork, that if it's within that normal range but delayed, I don't worry too much about it, not a big deal. Now, if there's a lot of other symptoms that are coexistent with that, or if it's a completely awkward grasp, I might raise a little more flags about that. Any questions so far? Okay. In normal sensory development, in infancy, the baby interacts with gravity. So you begin to see, even as the baby is on the, on the mother or the father, how they start to just lift their head up against gravity, right? You start to see the child interact with gravity in a way that helps to begin to let them begin to explore their environment. They start you know, really flexed, or if they're laying on the ground, they're just barely, barely lifting their head up. It's really interesting. What happens as that child lifts their head up against gravity is all the muscles of the spine begin to develop, really begin to de develop that core, proprioception, begins to help you develop where your body is in space, vestibular, begins to also help the muscles of your neck lifting up against gravity support the muscles of your eyes. So it's through all that anti-gravity work that we get a lot of postural ocular control, which is necessary for reading and writing and all those academic skills that come into play. A lot of that kind of stems off of our vestibular and posture and visual system. That's how we get that. Also, there's a whole lot of um, research your doctors probably tell you about that whole back to sleep movement. Kids really do need to be on their tummies. So even if it's a lot of time throughout the day and they're on your belly, on the floor, what happens again as they're on their belly, that's how they lift up, right? That's how they pull up against gravity. That's how all those muscles of the body develop. It's how the visual system begins to develop. Not only that, as you push up on your hands, all those arches in your hand begin to develop. This is what is helpful for fine motor skills and grasp. All of that happens when you start to work against gravity. And then I know there was a lot of, um, even when my, I have a 15 year old and when he was little, I think they were just starting to say that crawling wasn't really important. Crawling is hugely important. When you crawl, first of all, you're getting a ton of heavy work, a ton of joint muscle input. It's probably one of the most powerful ways to get all that input. You're developing the muscles and, and the arches of the hand. You also are doing huge bilateral movements. So movements that coordinate right and left sides of the body, which are later necessary for things like holding a paper for with one hand and writing with the other, riding a bike, skipping, hopping, all those things that require two sides of the body, writing on one side of the body and being able to cross over to the other side of the body. I see lots of children who still use a right hand for the right side of the body or a left hand for the left side of the body. Somewhat normal early, early on, but by a very young age, this is actually what my master's thesis was on, by about three years, it's pretty obvious that the child can cross over the midline of the body to do writing tasks. They shouldn't have to scoot over in the chair to the point where sometimes they fall out or to um, turn the paper to do the writing. 
all of those develop off of the vestibular proprioceptive and ocular system. So at an early age, they start to gain control and balance. Protective reactions develop as in infancy, right? So the ability to, to, as you're starting to fall, to put your hand down to catch yourself. Um, and writing reactions. This allows for, again, all those things that allow you to interact with your environment. So it happens very early on with the beginning of the sensory systems. In early childhood, then, that movement with the environment begins to develop your perceptual world. Things like Putting objects into your mouth is so huge at beginning to get visual spatial skills. It's by interacting with objects in our hands and in our mouth that we learn that that's a circle. Oh, or that's, you know, got a different shape to it. So you start to get those visual spatial skills, which is really necessary then to know that a B and a P and a D all look the same, except for in different directions. So all of that develops from early on tactile system and of um, oral motor like ex exploration all off of the sensory system. You begin to get eye-hand coordination and right-left awareness. Early on in infancy, we have reflexes, right? Any of you have babies at home? Yeah. When they turn their head, do you notice an arm comes up? It's called ATNR. Your UHF is, is connected. They turn their head one way, their hand's going to come up. It's totally we, some of us still pull it up um, as adults. It's still kind of its present sometimes. But what happens then is that ATNR gets integrated. There's a whole bunch of stuff about reflex integration right now, but that reflex get, gets integrated so that I can turn my head without my arm coming up here so that I can actually turn my head. I can know that I have a left side. I know that I have a, when I move this, is it? Yeah. I can try to put it on. It's okay, you can hold it. Thank you, wait. It's just the gesturing sometimes. Without my hands. Is that okay? Okay, okay, you guys like that better. Um, so, ooh, I can't that. UHF is you, connected. So you, have, you, you start to develop a midline. I have a left side, I have a right side. And that's, you know, babies start to play kind of out here. How old are your babies? Five months? Eleven months, right? So your baby's starting to bring their hands together, they're playing at things in their mouth. Five months? Maybe still a little one-sided, maybe starting to rotate, roll, but things that start to give you awareness and that I have a right side and a left side and I can work on my right side or I can work on my left side or I can cross the middle of my body. I can do all those things. Visual discrimination through drawing and the increased ability to move your body gives you more information to your tactile system your vestibular system and your visual system, which gives you that knowing of where your body is and where your muscles are in relation so that I can do my buttons and my scissors and my fasteners without UHF having to look at them. Is connected. I can stand on one foot on my pants because I have the balance now to be able to do that. So sensory processing really and sensory integration really lays the foundation for all future learning. Today I had a kid in the clinic. He is five, and he's autistic. He is thriving now. So he was initially um, diff had difficulty, like just even walking on a little bit. Mat, UHF maybe this is big. Connected. He would not want to do it. it would, he would become very uncomfortable with that. And actually, the picture in your handout with a kid going up the ramp. That's him. And that was with a lot of support. And today, I put the trapeze really, really low. And he was holding on the trapeze. And you could see his motor planning. He's like, I know I need to lift my leg, but I can't quite figure it out. Well, finally, he figured it out. And he was doing it over and over and over again with such joy. I call that kid power. I almost named the clinic kid power. But the truth is, the clinic opened 21 years ago, so you needed to be the first in the phone book with A for A. But, so they're, when they're in this kid power moment, that's when they want to do things over and over and over again. And that's called an adaptive response. When you go to the park and you see your child playing and they do something and they want to do it over and over and over again, they're building the motor planning. They're building the praxis to do that. And then what you'll see, and this is what I saw in the clinic today, he's now holding on to the trapeze 
and he sees a step in front of him. His mom and I could see in his brain where he's holding onto the trapeze. He starts to lift his leg, and there was something in the movement that we knew. He's now trying to combine two actions. He's trying to figure out, now, how can I use this moving piece of equipment to get onto there and move my body? And that's what happens in total normal development. But you have to have that knowing of where your body is in space, your joint muscle awareness, and all those things pulled together for all of that to happen. In mid-childhood, that even develops even further into figure ground space, um, skills, so, and also into spatial perception and spatial awareness. Initially in infancy, your five-month-old really operates in what we call body space. It's like body, body tactile, it's UHF oral. Is it's a lot of like... You can take off the mic. Okay. Oh, okay. We're just going to do this. As their baby gets a little bit older, they start to move out into a little bit farther space, probably within five feet. So kind of arms reach and can start to think about crawling out into the environment, navigating into the environment. A little bit later, what they start to do is navigate into distance space. So it's with it's greater than five feet away. It's like also starts to work into mental space where you can say, hey, we're going to go to the park. And your child is like, yay, we're going to the park. But they might not might be thinking about what they're going to do at the park yet until you get to the park and they see it and they're like, oh, there's a swing, I'm going to play that swing, I'm going to play that slide, etc. And then later, as they get a little older, that spatial awareness and spatial understanding becomes, um, um, we're going to go to the park. And they can be at your house, like, the park? Okay, when we go to the park, I'm going to do all these cool things with my body. And they can visualize it, and they can see it, and they can spatially orient to it. And then when they get to the park, they can actually navigate it to do those things. But it all comes from the knowing of your body and the sensory processing awareness. Spatial awareness is also super important for those later skills, like soccer, basketball, baseball, all those things that kids do in relation to other children. Sometimes we'll see kids that can do stationary things like kick a ball or catch a ball, but when it comes to practice, and there's other kids in this space, and they're having to navigate around the other kids in this space, and time when the ball is going to come to them, then all those things, it becomes more complex, right? It might even become more complex if the oddest gray environment just becomes more complex. And so that then, in those environments, this kid who can kick a ball or catch a ball starts to have a little more trouble. So, again, I want you to... Part of the goal tonight, aside from just you know talking about what normal development looks like and having you have a greater you know knowledge of how to support your child's development, is to be a detective in what your child is already trying to tell you about what their nervous system needs. Every single one of your children's nervous system needs something a little bit different. There is no um, there are some general guidelines that I know that linear movement is almost always calming. You know, movement on one hook or rotary is almost always excitatory. But, so there's some generalities, but all your kids are different. Your kid might need a ton more movement than your child. Your child might be afraid of movement. So the key is, in some of the things I'm telling you right now, beginning to be a detective about what your child's nervous system tells you that they need and what they, what they need to um, function in their most optimal zone of, of arousal. We all have this optimal zone of arousal that we function in and we do things throughout the day to support ourselves to get into that optimal zone of arousal. And I'll speak more to that in a minute. Your children do too. So they've been giving you some clues about what they need and what they do to get to that window. And, I, and we'll get more into that. You have a triangle there. I'm sure it's going to be really, really hard to see. But envision, and do you want me to hold this anymore? You don't need to. I'm going to end up throwing it. <laughs> envision an inverted triangle and everything kind of funneling up to the top. From my perspective as an occupational therapist who specializes in sensory integration and sensory processing, the sensory systems lay the foundation. So all those eight systems that we just talked about, taste, touch, smell, hear, see, movement, interoception, they lay the foundation for everything else, everything. Cognitive development, social development, bilateral skills, eye-hand coordination skills, all of that comes from the sensory systems processing information in a such a way that it allows the child or the individual to respond adaptively to the environment. 
So that's, that's the importance of those sensory systems. Also, I will tell you that the glue that makes all of that stick is the relationship. The relationship that from the parent-child, also the relationship with the teachers and the children. I saw it last year in class here. One of the little boys, um, probably all of your children have one teacher who they really is their go-to person. And oftentimes you guys know this too, that you know that might be, for a difficult child, that might, maybe not even difficult, an anxious child, a child who needs a little more support. That, that teacher is going to be the one with the relationship to help that child when they're in times of stress or disruption. So the relationship is really the key and the glue for all of that to develop. I have a picture here. This is a picture of a little boy, actually it's my 15 year old, when he was, I don't know, five, tying his shoe. For a second, actually think of tying a shoe or think of something that your child, no, let's think of trying, tying a shoe. Let's think of tying a shoe. How many sensory systems are involved in tying a shoe? You need vision, right? You need to be able to locate the shoe and the lace and your hands to the shoe, right? You need to be able to visually see it. What else do you need? Touch. Touch, yes. You need to actually touch. You need to be able to really discriminative touch, right? You need to be able to uh, touch that lace and you need bilateral skills to do all the stuff that is related to tying that shoe. You also need to know where your body is, right? You need to know where your foot is to bend down or to sit down and get to your shoe. You need what else? Anybody thinking of something we didn't mention? You need to be regulated to tie that shoe, right? It's so funny because at our clinic, um, kids come in, first thing they do is take off their shoes. We play barefoot all day or in socks. And at the end of the session, it's time to put your shoes and socks back on. Many of our parents have us working on that skill of putting on socks and putting on shoes for the child. Many of the children are quite capable of putting on socks and shoes at the end of the session, unless they have a friend that they've been playing with and they're a little distracted, right? Or unless they got too overexcited and now they're not calm enough to tie the shoe. So there's regulation that's involved. There's many things that are involved. Think of anything, think of anything. Think of one thing that you have to do in the morning to get your child out of the house. And just think about all the things that are involved in that. Auditorily, they need to hear you say, hey, go get your shoes. Go get your socks. Put on your coat. We're about to leave. All of those things are involved in any task. So one of the things that we talk about is the just right challenge. So if you've asked your child to do something and you're not quite getting the adaptive response that you want or the response that meets the demands of the situation, you have to ask yourself, was it the just right challenge? What that means is was it not too hard and not too easy? Was it just the right amount of challenge for that child? And if the first question you're going to ask yourself is, was it developmentally appropriate? So for like that kid tying the shoe, he's about five, is that developmentally appropriate? Yes, it's developmentally appropriate for a five or six-year-old to tie their shoe. It's actually getting much later now with Velcro. And when I started as an occupational therapist, it was in our scales for um, zero to four, I believe. Like kids were beginning to tie their shoe. We do not see it that early anymore. So... Um, you ask yourself, is it developmentally appropriate? So you've asked your child to do something, they're frustrated, they're not complying, they're not doing what you've asked, is it developmentally appropriate? Should a four-year-old, three-year-old, two-year-old be able to do this task? If your answer is yes, if, if the answer is no, stop. <laughs> if the answer, help them. If the answer is yes, then you have to look at what are the unique strengths and weaknesses of your child. So what might be going on for that child individually that is contributing it to it? Is it a sensory-based thing? Do you know that your child, let's say it's um, sitting at the dinner table and you only want them to sit for 10 minutes. So if your child's not sitting for 10 minutes, then you might ask yourself, is it a sensory-based issue? Do I know that my child needs some movement prior to sitting at the table to support their nervous system to be able to sit? Do they need an alternative seating device at the table to be able to sit? What is my expectation? My husband, this is on Facebook Live, I hope he's not watching. But no, it doesn't matter. It's, my husband used to have an expectation for our young kids when they were very little that they would sit at the table for, I don't even know, it felt like forever. And we were gonna have this conversation. Both my children are adopted. My oldest son has anxiety and is very impulsive. My younger son has ADHD and dyslexia. 
And I don't even know why I tell you that. There was no way that these kids were sitting at the table. I myself don't like to sit that long. So it was really hard, right, for my kids to sit at the table. I shouldn't even use this diagnosis because this could be any family. This could be your family. Like sitting at the table and trying to get dinner and sit at the table is too hard. So what do you need to do? You need to look at their sensory systems. At my house, what we would do is we would play airport. I remember many months of playing airport where we would take the heavy cushions off the couch. My son loved conveyor belts. And we would take them off the couch and put them on a fake conveyor belt so that we could watch them go. And it was a ton of heavy work. Anytime you do heavy work, pushing, pulling, jumping, lifting, all of those things that contract the muscles of the nervous system, muscles of the body, usually are very calming. So if you did about 10 minutes of that activity, it's usually going to be calming in the nervous system for about 90 minutes. So if you have a child that's very, very active, you might try doing a lot more wheelbarrow walking, animal walks, anything that involves that heavy muscles of the nervous system, heavy muscles of the body, and see if that supports their ability to sit. So you're asking yourself about the sensory system. Is it too loud? Do I know that my child can't go to Red Robin because it's too loud for them and they're gonna cover their ears or they're not gonna be able to hear me? Do you know that your child is already the child that you're not gonna to take to the grocery store because when you take them to the grocery store, you see their behavior escalate? And is that possibly because of the auditory environment, the visual environment? How do you support them? Those are all questions to begin to ask. Is it a gross motor difficulty that they're having for the reason that they're not doing that task that you said was developmentally appropriate? Is it a fine motor reason that they're not doing it? Is it cognitive? Do they, or auditory processing, did they not understand the task that you asked them to do? Or maybe if it was one-to-one, -one, they could have understood it, but now that I'm in a larger environment or there's more people talking, I'm having a hard time filtering out the background and focusing in on the foreground. All of this, again, is within the range of what is expected, but sometimes if there's a cumulative effect or if it is a disruption in the way the child is processing information, and you see these sort of habits forming, it might be something that maybe needs a little more addressing. And then, once you've considered those, you need to consider your child's regulation level. Like, is this the right time? I always tell parents, like, sometimes you need to consider things as, you know, husband and wives or partners as putting things into baskets. You know, is this behavior something that we're gonna put in basket A, that every time we see this behavior, we are going to do whatever we just agreed on as the consistent response to that. Or is this a basket B behavior that depending on the situation, depending on where we're at, depending on what's going on, we might let it slide, we might not. Or is it a basket, did I do A, A, B, C, a basket C behavior that um, this behavior is never going to go, it's never allowed, it's not safe, whatever. So um, really always looking at your child's regulation level in response to that as well. So real quickly, I just wanted to tell you what sensory processing disorder might look like. And again, I, I do want to stress that just because your child has one or two of this does not mean that they have a sensory processing disorder. It means that they have a unique way of processing sensory information that might or might not need just your support, might need accommodations, might need one-to-one -one direct services. But a lot of times kids who have sensory processing disorder are overly sensitive to touch or movement. So these might be the kids that the teachers are noticing that every time they go to do a craft project, they really want the stuff wiped off of their hands. As soon as the glue gets on their hands, they want to go get it wiped off. They might not even come to the table. They might be the child who's super avoidant of anything that is going to make their hands messy. These might be the kids that don't play in grass or sand or dirt or do it very hesitantly. They might be the kids that don't walk barefoot on grass or sand or dirt because it just doesn't feel good. Um, tags in the shirt, very picky about clothing. Similarly, you can see that in all the systems. So it might be similar with movement, where this is a child that, despite being three or four, I, um, there is a swing set, yeah. So these might be children who never play on the swing sets. Or if they go to play on the swing set, they might lay on their tummy because sitting up requires a lot more postural control. These might be kids that have trouble walking up the steps into the classroom. Just feel a little more frightened when their feet leave the ground. These might be children that you might remember now as infants didn't want their head tilted back for a diaper change or head tilted back for showering or um, washing their hair because anytime you tilt your head back, it was that fear of falling. Sights and sounds could be too. They also could be underreactive. I remember when I was a newer therapist doing an evaluation on a child and 
we had to have them cutting, and he was cutting, and he cut himself, and never felt that, like never felt that he cut himself. I've had parents tell me that their child had have ruptured eardrums, never felt it. Broken bones, never felt it. Um, and that's an extreme. But it could be children that just seem to seek more movement, seek more intensity. They're the kids like bull in a china shop. They just love a lot more intensity. They need the bear squeezes and pushed under the cushions of the couch, want to be buried under things. And again, all within the range of normal until it's not. Um, their activity level might be unusually high or low. The kids that are activity levels that are low are often the children that are missed. You know, they're the children that just kind of like, you know, a little slower. You know, not really disruptive in class, just kind of maybe go with the flow, but they, they, they need a little more boost to get their nervous system where they can interact and they can engage and they can have these successful social engagements. Uh, you might see coordination problems, delays in language. They, these kids could be impulsive or distractible, poor organization. In the, in the later ages, seven-ish, eight-ish, we start to see kids that when they haven't had sensory processing, difficulties addressed, start to get some um, embarrassment, possibly self-esteem issues happening because they recognize that things have been harder for them or that they're the kid that always falls out of a chair. So if you're the kid that doesn't know where your body is and you go to sit in your chair and you're always falling out of the chair, you have a couple options, right, when you're like eight, nine. You become the class clown, I meant to do it, or you can get really embarrassed. Um, these kid, kids often have difficulty with self-regulation and participating in their occupations. I really love this chart. I don't know if you can see it. But I talked about that optimal band of arousal that we all have. And for many of us, for most of us, I'm going to assume for all of us, based on what I've seen in the last 50 minutes, our optimal band of arousal is, is fairly wide. We can handle a lot, right? We can handle the fact that I have to be somewhere at six and you're not doing what you need to do and honey, you did not help me and now I'm going to be late to this presentation and oh, I forgot to blah, 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 blah and tomorrow I have this and you know, your nervous system just gets really excited and irritable even maybe and then you're like, wait, you do your self-talk and you take a deep breath, everything's going to be okay, not a big deal or I can like, okay, I'm going to take a little walk, whatever you need to do to bring your arousal level, if you will, your physiological state of alertness and feeling comfortable back to this optimal band of arousal. We do it all day, right? So many of our children then, especially if they end up having sensory processing disorder, their, narrow, their band is much narrower. So they can get in this optimal band, but it doesn't take much. It might take one sensory event to just knock that child out of that optimal level of arousal to where they then um, are either usually in a state of fight, flight, or fright, or a fight, flight, or fright or freeze, shut down. So one of the things that we can do for any of our nervous systems, we do it for us, for your children, is really begin to look at those periods of the day where they maybe are not functioning in that optimal band of arousal as well as they could. And I know, believe me, I know, four o'clock, five o'clock, hour from hell, hostage in my own home, witching hour. It's, they're, it's hard, right? Like you. You yourself have pulled it together all day, and then your partner comes home, it's time for dinner, we need to cook, we need to get kids wherever they need to be. Um, but how can we support our children, particularly in those events that we know are triggers, and support their nervous system so that they're, what we do when we provide sensory input to their nervous system in a way that they like, and things that they kind of indicated that they need, we increase that band for them so that they're not bumping out of it as often. And your teachers do this in school, I know they do. Oftentimes, teachers either intuitively or um, with knowledge that they've gained look at putting like academic tasks or writing tasks or drawing tasks embedded within movement breaks, recess, so that there's this sort of red task, green task, hard task, easy task. And then before the hard task, there's usually right some kind of movement break or play opportunity for that. What is hard for one child might not be hard for the other, right? It might be circle time that's hard for one, where it's recess that's hard for another. I know your teachers are putting supports in place for your children so that they can all be successful as a, as a whole, but I'm sure they've probably begun to identify different ways that each of your individual children also need support. And that's what you can do as well, is identify how can I put these supports in place for my child so that they can not be so overwhelmed. Sensory processing disorder is really an umbrella term 
for what we see as a modulation disorder, and that's when the nervous system's response doesn't match what the, what, what the situation is. And that's when we usually see children who are either over-responsive or under-responsive or who seem to be sensory seeking. We'll talk about that a little bit. Or we'll see discrimination disorder, and that's when you're having difficulty matching the qualities of the, of, of the sensory stimuli. It's like being able to pull, pick in your uh, pocket and pull out a quarter versus a dime or a nickel. So it's very different. It's not like over or under responsive, but it's identifying the qualities of the sensory stimuli. And then there's praxis or motor planning. I do want to point out, I think I've, I've said it a lot, like that ability to modulate our arousal level plays into our ability to be calm and alert and organized. I'm going to stop for just a second. Any questions so far? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I, I've read about uh, sensory processing this one before, but I'm very confused sometimes uh, looking online. Is it the same thing or is it uh, uh, correlated with being a highly sensory child? Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. So her question is, is sensory processing disorder the same as being a highly sensitive child? We see highly sensitive children not only to sensory stimuli, but also to just things in the environment. It can be emotional sensitivity, it can be, um, it can be a variety of different reasons that a child is, is a, say sensory sensitive? Highly sensitive. highly sensitive child. Yeah, there's a book called The Highly Sensitive Child. These children are usually are a little more reactive, a little okay. more prone to reactivity. Okay. Um, very similar in the way that their nervous system box out of that just right level of arousal quite easily and still needing some support to put them back in. Yeah. Okay, are we sort of on the right track of sort of why you came? Oh, yeah. Question on, um, on the exercise. My child has is going through it difficult with specifically underwear uh -huh. and it is off the rails. Yeah. Would doing the push pull and all that before we go get dressed? Yes, maybe wow, help? Uh, yes, 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 okay. yes. Like so, we'll barrel to a room and. I know, all... it sounds so weird, but no, it's I mean, true. No, I mean, I'll take whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the tactile system has two pathways it has a light touch pathway that is more of your protective response that lets you know what touched you and where it touched you. It's very light touch. It usually is that system that puts off a defensive response. Mm -hmm putting on your underwear, putting on your clothes, it's a little more of that light touch system. Mm -hmm. It also has a deep touch system. To, tactile input to the deep touch system in general is more calming and modulates that input to the light touch system. So in general, yes, I have had, and, it, and it's in, we're seeing a ton more prevalence now of kids who have a specific tactile sensitivity to one thing. Usually it is underwear or socks or shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, the, and these kids, like sometimes their socks have to be exactly correct. And that might be your child. And if they're like, have to be exactly correct, and then you slide the shoe in and you're out the door, no big deal. But if it takes you 30 minutes to get the sock in the exact right spot or can't find the right sock, you're starting to deal with something a little more complicated that, you know, just again, sets that child's little nervous system up in a place where it's, it's, it's prone to be a little more reactive because it's not feeling as comfortable. So, and the, and the thing that's real is sensory um, reactions like that are really real to the child, mm -hmm. um, as you know from their behavior. Yeah. But you are exactly correct, and I love that you got that from this little minute right now. I've been through the brushing and the massaging, and that doesn't work, so that's okay. why I'm, I'm like, okay. is this the next step? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I had a little girls group one time, who, of ch children who didn't like putting their socks on, and it was like heroic efforts for their parents to get them to school in the morning. and. Um, they came up with ideas themselves of like doing deep pressure to their legs or doing jumps and sometimes it was like putting it on and then jumping. So heavy work almost always is calming for the nervous system. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a, that's a very big question. So there are some programs that we'll use for children at this age, two to five is where you guys come out here, right? Yeah, two to five. There's a program called the Alert Program. There's um, zones of regulation, but usually, like, I'll do, and I think you could all do this, like, 
was it gonna, I think, okay. This is good, because this, I'm gonna edit this. I think I should put this in here. Sometimes we'll talk to kids like, your body's like a car. And sometimes a car can go really, really fast, right? It can go like, you know, Lightning McQueen fast. And sometimes it can go really, really slow. Like, I don't know, it's made or slow. Like it can go really, really slow. Or sometimes it goes just right, like the speed limit. And so you can start to just play with those terms with your children. Is there one you guys use here? Do you use zones of regulation or the alert program? Because it is really cool when you get a... What's that? Zones of regulation, we yeah. talked about that. Yeah. And we talked about how does your body feel. What, what words do you use? Um, do you use colors like blue, yellow, red, green? We do have, I have a, in my classroom for specific kids that seem to really need that visual part yeah. of it. They can't just... Yeah, so the first answer to the question, I'm glad you reminded me, would be to touch base with the teacher for what you're using in the classroom. Or if your child does go to therapy and they do have words they're using at therapy, bringing them back to the teacher so that everybody's on the same language. For two-year-olds, I really love zones of regular, no, sorry, I really like the alert program. And that's the one I was talking about with um, fast, slow, and just right. And you can do it nonchalantly, right? And what, it doesn't hurt any child, right? To be like, oh, your body's moving really fast. You're like a race car. You're, you're, um, you're, you're in the, you could say you're in the red zone. Like, not a big deal. It's not negative. It's not bad. It's just like you're in the red zone. And then when their body is like sitting at the table and they're coloring, like, wow, look at you. And like, your body is like moving like just right. It's, it's in the green zone. And then when they wake up in the morning and they're really, really tired and they're having a hard time moving, you might say, wow, your body's in the blue zone. Like, it's having a really hard time moving. You just label it. You label it for you. You label it for them. And then when one day they're really, really mad because they didn't get the cup that they wanted at the dinner table, you're like, wow, you're in the red zone. Look at you. You're like, face is mad. You're angry. And you're just labeling it. You're just creating this language for your family, whatever it is. And if it works for you, sharing it with them, because the idea then is they begin to help identify. You can't change your arousal level. Your child can, first of all, two through five-year-olds very rarely change their arousal level on their own. You know, a lot of times we're the co-regulators. So we are, the, as parents, as teachers, are really still, it's our job to help support them, to regulate them. But we need to help them begin to identify. 21% of the population right now has emotional difficulties. Helping them to identify what those zones are, so that you can say, wow, you're in the red zone, but we are coloring right now. I really need your body in the green zone so we can color. And my kids, I remember at one point, my son must have been nine or 10, where he's like, mom, I am done with your yellow zone, red zone, green zone. But it's so helpful to begin to help them just have a language around whatever's developmentally appropriate for them. The one you're talking about, has a lot more emotional content to it, like sad and happy, and um, a lot of the younger kids don't quite get that just yet, but that's another one. And there's so much literature on zones of regulation or um, the alert theory. So just having some kind of common language. It would be great for Little Acorn, yeah, to have that and really start it at two, so that then it develops up until the kids are five. But what's even greater, and again, part of what my passion is, is to then help all these grades everywhere. This should be such normal language. Like, hey, I need a break. Like, I just need a quick break. I just need to go, like, walk real quick. I need to, whatever I need to do. And it doesn't stop in fifth grade. It doesn't stop in sixth grade. In high school, it's still a child might need to, like, notice when they might need to do something really, really quick, might be much more discreet, much more simple to get their nervous system back in the just right place to be able to do the demands of the situation. And you can start by practicing that at home. It's a, it's a complicated question, 
because on some level, we all question ourselves as parents all the time, right? Like, is what I'm doing right? Um, but he has to feel good to you, and um, it seems like it's meeting her need. I don't, I don't know the context of it and what's happened. I don't know what you're doing. Also, like, if, if she's a child who leaves school and needs a little sensory break to go play with the swings or do something to kind of get her body back to that just right level before you can move on. I think the key would be, and where you might feel like you're enabling, is if you're always giving in to her. And that's where it might be, like, thinking about, like, is this a situation where I'm kind of able to do this? And, you know, looking at, like, if it forces her to become or helps her, helps her, forces her, encourages her, starts to manifest itself as more rigidity, where the plan can't change, then it might become more of an issue. Because some, it won't work for you all the time, right? But that's, you kind of have to look at, like, is this, is this a place where I can, can do this? And maybe just making subtle shifts in it so she's not so prone to the same thing all the time. But I don't know your child. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking, like, I guess generally, like, even, like, with my six-year-old, like, if she likes to do something, like, if she has a mindset on something, for example, like, if we don't let her do that, then she'll be upset. For example, like, an art project or something, like, she's focused on it, we're like, okay, time's up, let's go to some activity or let's go outside. Like, she can't, in my head, I was like, maybe she can't possibly, she gets really angry, goes from zero to ten. And then I have to explain to her, but she's not processing it. And then the minute that I'm like, okay, how about just a couple more minutes? And then she gets back into the system, and then she's calm. She gets to complete what she wanted to complete, and then she's back to normal. So I guess in my head, I'm, there's a traditional way of parenting, right? Like this is the way I want to say my parents raised me, where they would not tolerate that, and they'd just be like, that's ridiculous. You know, she, she needs to be taught A, B, and C. Versus nowadays where we're like, well, maybe it's your sensory, maybe it's sensitivity, maybe it's something else. But at the same time, am I just not regulating versus, do you get what I'm trying I do. To say? It's like I do, and I have a lot of thoughts on that. Yeah. So I would go back to this. And so is what you're asking her to do the just right challenge? And is it developmentally appropriate? Is, it, is she six? Is it developmentally appropriate for her to be able to transition from one activity to the next and to be able to understand that we only have five minutes and we're going to transition to the next activity? And if it is so hard for her, then looking at what do I know about this child? And is it a little bit of cognitive rigidity around, like, no, it's, I need to do it this way and I need to see it through and it's, you know, like, I'm really stuck that way. Um, so, but what I do know, and I think the biggest answer I have for this question, kids need parameters and kids love routine. They also need a, 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 a gentle leader. Um, they need to know where the boundaries are and they need clear, consistent expectation. I think that that's, that's and I, I'm seeing a ton, I know parenting is so confusing and I do things wrong all the time. And I'm sure my kids are in counseling around me. We all, <laughs> that's what we do, right? But um, I see a lot of parents now who are really confused on when to put boundaries on their children. I see two-year-olds that won't leave the waiting room because X, Y, Z, and a lot of negotiation happening. Two-year-olds not ready to, to negotiate with you. You know, um, they need to know what the rule is, what the boundary is, and be very clear and consistent on that. I think that might be where you're struggling, is you're asking, you know, um, it's confusing, you know, and, and what, how much do we do this sort of dialogue? And in general, I say, you know, clear, consistent expectations can be playful and accepting and curious and empathetic and all of that. And then, um, but it's but we do have to leave now. So I think, and then sometimes we don't have to leave. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, I and mean, yeah. I truly see kids really need boundaries, and they really, really thrive on knowing what is expected of them. And I see it all the time where kids will say, you know, especially if it's like a split house, what, why, why does that happen in mom's house and not dad's house? Well, because mom doesn't make me. You know, mom says sometimes, you know, so, um, but I don't know your child, and your child might have more of a struggle with that flexibility and, and, and rigidity and might need some support. So it sounds like you did it so well. 
So you listened to her, you gave her a couple more minutes, you're curious, you said you even out, you're curious, you said, I, I, I wonder why. Those are, it's a pace model, it's the model I use, being playful, accepting, curious, and empathetic, and still holding that boundary and that consistent expectation. Any of you teachers have any other thoughts on that? Did you feel like I kind of answered it? It seems like it, yeah. Yeah, it's hard, it's really hard. I think it's like so hard because you know how we're being educated on like, you know, sensory or highly sensitive children. And like, we all wanna, you know, understand our kids, but at, at the same time, like, that's what I was trying to do whenever I see like my six year old, like, specifically, like, rigid in her ways. I'm like, maybe she's just trying to have time to process. And that might be and true. Let, me, let me give her that time to so process. You're doing it, yeah. You're looking at like, it. Like, a part of me is like, is she being manipulative? Is she like, <laughs> her brains are not developed to be manipulative yet. I love that. Oh, that, that is usually. 27 or 24, what is it, right? That is usually <laughs> the topic of my presentation. Two year olds are not, four year olds, five year olds, oh, six year olds. Six year olds. Like, they, they're usually not, all behavior has meaning. So, t t children are usually not trying to be defiant or oppositional or any of those things, particularly at these younger age. Something is not working for them. So, and I don't know if your child has other diagnosis or other unique traits. Um, so sometimes, and this is where OT will come into the school, so I think uh, next week and a couple weeks later, I'm gonna just go in and do some screenings in the classroom. Um, just to like look at the classroom, some of the teachers in the classroom, Sometimes I might say, hey, you know, what's going on with this child, and blah, 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 and if the teacher needs any support, it might be just a little bit of support in the classroom for the teacher. Usually they're dead on. Um, and then and sometimes that's all a child needs, just a tiny bit of support in certain situations. Uh, sometimes they might need a more of an individual assessment to see if there any of those other things need more addressing. Um, yeah, and sometimes it might just be putting strategies in place at the, ho at the house. Any more questions on anything about? Yeah. Do children grow out of it, processing disorder? Typically, children will not grow out of sensory processing disorder on their own. What they'll do is they'll develop compensation strategies. So, and that's okay, right? So, if it works. But sensory integration and theory and sensory processing work is designed to actually change neural pathways. I, I, I don't want to leave you like this. I, I want to give you some nuggets. And so I was trying to design this. Lindsay and I were talking last night. Um, I want to give you some things that will generally be helpful. So and it's, a, it's a whole other slide, but um, in the vestibular system, that movement system that plays really closely into attention and focus, you can think of like movement opportunities generally lasting in a nervous system eight to 12 hours. So if you have a child that seeks a ton of movement information, like your kid is like constantly on the go, maybe impulsive with their movement, you're gonna really want to put movement opportunities in throughout their day, because they need it. Your teacher's probably maybe already putting movement opportunities in throughout the school day. If your child never gets satisfied with movement, like they could be the child who like is literally running all day and never seems to stop, if you combine that movement with any sort of heavy work. So they go to the swing, they play at the park, and they you know, do their swinging, they do their running, they do all that stuff. Maybe before you go, you do like help them on the monkey bars. Again, heavy work, almost always common. You might wheelbarrow walk them to the car. Those sort of things that kind of, that heavy work is gonna modulate that movement input. So if you have a kid who's constantly on the go. If you have a child on the other hand that you take the park and won't engage with any of the objects at the park, those are the kids I really want to see. Like defensiveness is hard. If your child is gravitationally insecure, so afraid when their feet leave the ground, or sensitive to movement, sensitive to touch, they usually need a little bit more support, maybe from a professional, because it becomes a barrier to anything else. And often will put that child in a state of fight, fight or fright, almost looks like anxiety. But a little gentle encouraging there. What a lot of our children will do is only move their head in this plane. The way that we register movement in our ear is through our semi canals and our gravity receptors. So we register it up and down, we register it forward and back, we register it diagonal, and we register it rotary. So you wanna encourage your child through play. Play wrestling is one of the best things that you can do. Play wrestling is so fun because imagine you get a ton of heavy work, right? Push and pull and they're crawling away from mom or dad and you're pulling them back and it's 
playful, there's a lot of regulation that happens too. Like, wait, stop, that hurt, or wait, stop, that's too much. And like, everybody's excited and we go again. Play, pause, play, pause, red light, green light, red light, green light. It's a really fun way to develop that. Um, so heavy work is, is really good for the nervous system. And some of your children might be children that need a lot of heavy work before even going to sleep. You really have to look at your child's nervous system. If they're like constantly on the go and having trouble settling down for sleep, they might need more heavy work, more pushing opportunities, jumping opportunities, um, things like that to support the nervous system to be more right down regulated to be able to transition to sleep. It's kind of a, a counterintuitive way of thinking. If you're a child like you've been trying, like turning off the lights, gentle music, calm backstroking, reading a book, and none of that is working, they're still jacked up, if you will, they might be a child who actually needs heavy work to calm down. It's really individual that way. Um, in general, movement is gonna be more excitatory if it's on one hook or if it's rotary or if their head is down or inverted. Um, movement that is on like a rocking chair or a swing that's going back and forth or in your lap going back and forth is generally more calming. For the joint muscle system, all of that, like play wrestling, wheelbarrow walking, animal walks, you, that can last in the nervous system for a very long time, and in general, you will not go wrong. So if your child is having trouble settling down, you might try pulling in some of those joint muscle activities. Also, breath. But it's very hard to tell a two to five year old that they're really upset. You're in the red zone, and you need to take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, you need to calm down. What your two to five year old most likely will do is go, <gasps> if they even listen to you. So you need to be thinking about um, things that encourage breath in a playful way. So I remember my son, the busy one, would be playing with his friends, and I remember I was at work one time and I called my husband, I was like, how's it going? He's like, we are never doing this again. All the boys were running around. But I said, hey, take a, take a um, saucepan, put some dish soap in it, grab some straws, have them just blow a bubble. Did you hear my, my voice actually just lowered and I slowed down, you found breath in a playful way. So you could tell your kids if they're really excited and having a hard time slowing down, you might create this bubble bucket and do some blowing activities. You might do things like if you've just got them really excited or you need them to calm down before you sit down at the dinner table. Heavy work or blowing. You might crawl to the dinner table like snakes. Again, really getting at respiration. If you focus on the exhale and getting a really long exhale, children will take a really nice inhale to recover. So you could be bunnies. See how my breath just did that? You're really taking a nice three-dimensional breath. You could do all those things to support breath and regulation for your child in a way that's very playful for them. As they get older, if you have five-year-olds and you've introduced the language of like, um, yellow zone, blue zone, green zone, or red zone, or you've introduced like your engine's running really fast. Hey, let's see what happens if we're like snakes for a minute. Oh, you see what happened? Now you're in the green zone. Wow. Like you start to like talk to them. I mean, I, I get when they get a little older, they think you're corny, but at that age, it's, it's pretty cool and it's really empowering. Really empowering to bring this mindfulness into a child's life and their ability to notice when they need a break. Um, so heavy work is almost always calming. Be careful with vestibular, be careful with movement. Um, it can be over excitatory. You can, you can help to modify that with breath or proprioceptive input. In general, light touch is gonna be more of a defensive response where deep touch is gonna be more calming. If you have a child that is a child that socks bother them, underwear bother them, you might, let the teachers know because that might be a kid that they don't want to come up from behind and be like, hey Johnny, that kid might get really upset. It might be a reason for why your child wants to be in the front of the line or the beginning of the line for your teacher because they don't like touch. And if you're in the middle of the line, particularly in second two-year-old to five-year-old, what's going to happen? You're going to get bumped from both sides. So those children generally are pretty smart. Like they come up with a strategy. I'll be in the front of the line or the back of the line because it's going to be a little less overwhelming for me. Um, and the auditory system, the best thing I can tell you at this age is just to be aware of the auditory environment. If your child seems a little more distracted in complex environments, just be aware of that. If your child covers their ears to noises, maybe start to think about what noises they are. 
Usually they're going to be low frequency sounds like toilets flushing, vacuum cleaners, blow dryers, blenders, hair dryers. Those kind of things are very low frequency and they don't tell you a lot of information about where they're coming from and they can be very overwhelming for children. Now, I also want to say, again, there's this range of normal, right? So it might be that your child covers their ears and says, oh, that hurts me, but then is able to move on with that. Or it might be that your child says, covers their ears and they're never, ever going to go into that bathroom. They're never, ever going to use anybody's bathroom but the bathroom at your own house. They're never, ever going to do whatever, or they do it, but afterwards they're very dysregulated. And those are more signs of an auditory defensiveness. And for right now, just be aware of that. Because that will help them in school, too, to be able to put strategies in place for when they're auditorily overwhelmed. Maybe they need a little space of quiet, a little time to just regroup. So we look at setting up spaces in the classroom or at home that really invite sensory-rich opportunities where they can move. We look at setting up places where there's more like a womb environment, where it's more calming, and you might have things in that environment that your child really likes. For some kids, it might be that they need a trampoline in their little quiet space. For other kids, they might need a book and a little blow toy or something like that, some tactile fidgets. So look at creating those environments for your children that allow them to meet their sensory needs. Um, I had a different idea there too, but I lost it. I feel like I left something hanging. Auditory. Oh, I did. I got it. I got it back. Um, all of our nervous systems do things to help ourselves regulate, right? You can probably think of like, I remember in graduate school, I would put hot tamales in my mouth to eat you know, little candies that are cinnamon and be 11 o'clock at night. I know I wasn't hungry. I wonder now in hindsight if the cinnamon gave me that alertness, that intensity, just keep awake, keep alert. So we all do these things, right? Be a little detective. Some things your children might be doing to tell you that this is what I really need. I need a lot of heavy work, mom. I need, a, I need to jump on my bed. And you gotta kind of let Aunt Tilly go. Aunt Tilly was like, no, 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 we don't jump on beds. You might break the bed, like, we don't do that. Or you might fall off and then you'll die. Um, Aunt Tilly might need to go away because your child might be that child. And if you're not okay with them jumping on a bed, you might need to find something else for them to jump on because their child might, your child might really need that. If you take something away that your child is using to regulate themselves, they're going to find something different. So kind of be a detective, or it's this whole pacifier thing, right? Like when you take it away, you know, like, oh, they weren't quite ready, they're gonna find something else. I shouldn't have even mentioned pacifiers, it's another, <laughs> I don't need to mention that. But if your child is the child that chews on their hair, or chews on their sleeve, that's a good one. Or, you know, chews on their shirt. Um, and again, it can be within the range of normal, but it also can be something they're really using to get their band of arousal, that optimal band of arousal. And if you're like, hey, Johnny, you can't chew in your shirt, no chewing in your shirt, because it, I mean, it's wet, it's nasty, you might be needing to replace that with something else to support them, because that might have been the tool that they really use to support themselves. If you take away something that a child is using to regulate, they're usually gonna find something different. It might even be um, more disruptive. So really, again, the key is to be a detective to what's going to support your child's nervous system. Any questions? Did I help at all? Yes. Okay. We'll down all your nervous down. systems are like, I'm ready to go. I hope that's what it is. I actually um, have taught, usually I teach to teachers and to um, therapists. I've done, I think, for parents a couple other times, but I really would like to go back into that with this sort of thinking of uh, what does sense, normal sensory development look like? And so even just today, I've added a couple of things that I might add. If you don't mind emailing Lindsay, or if I can send out an email, like if you have any feedback for me or feedback to give to Lindsay to give to me, I would really love it. And maybe what you came here for, did it meet your needs, or would you have liked something different? Those would be the three big questions that um, I would really love answered so that this is really helpful for other parents. Can we yeah. get an email version of just like- I absolutely can do that. Work. Actually, do you mind doing that? I posted it on parents. Oh, really? Sweet, thanks. Yeah. But if there's no other questions in the group, I'm happy to answer any my child questions. I don't know if I'll have the answer. They're really hard to answer those questions, but I'm happy to try. Or if you, you know, want me to get a, a, a good eye at your child during um, class, I'm happy to do that. So recently, um, my son's been dealing with a lot of the mind issues. So, How old is he? Um, he was four and a half. So we're just wondering, I mean, we've read 
bunch of books and they try to different uh, you know, approaches and nothing seems to really help them. So we're just wondering, we're we trying to figure out what's setting him off and how to help him cope with those feelings. But it's, it's almost like attention, but we're giving him enough attention if that makes sense. So um, he did have a new brother baby come in a lot of months ago, uh-huh. but we just, I mean, it didn't really start off until probably about five months ago, but now it's just kind of spiraling. are hard, right? Because I don't know that I have enough information to really help with that. Maybe I could have been speaking privately at the end and we can problem solve a little bit. Yeah. And they can help you as well. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. It's a, it's a, it's a catch-22, right? It always feels like, oh, let's see how he does and don't tell anybody. And then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll be here for questions if you guys have questions. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like and subscribe.